Okay. All right. Um, so uh, everybody, uh, my name is Campbell Grant. I am one of the fellows here at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Um, I have the pleasure this evening of introducing Dr. Pramod Reddy, who's our division director, who's going to give a talk about posterior urethral valves. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I hope everyone's doing well. And uh, before we get started today, I just want to say what an incredible privilege it is for me to be invited to spend the next hour with you. And uh, I just want to say thank you very much for your service. I know this year has been a, uh, I know the word unprecedented has been overused, but truly has been unprecedented. None of us could have imagined the impact that the COVID virus was going to have on all of us, but on your training and uh, how we are learning and teaching during this time. Uh, but you have uh, been unwavering in your service and taking care of patients. And so thank you so much for that. Uh, you guys are truly inspirational and uh, really in awe of everything that you guys do every day. I thought what we do today is start with a few cases. So um, case number one here is a uh, infant, a newborn infant, day of life zero, just delivered and transferred to our NICU and uh, had an ultrasound done because of an antenatally detected hydronephrosis. Now, when you look at an ultrasound on a newborn, you want to look at the size of the kidney. A typical full-term newborn should have a five-centimeter kidney, and there, there should be uh, you know, normal echotexture. And you can see here that we compare the echogenicity of the kidney to, on the right side, the liver, on the left side, the spleen. And these kidneys are brighter than the parenchyma of the liver, so that's increased echogenicity. Uh, a little bit of hydronephrosis, not a lot. On the left side, there's a parenchymal cysts. So these are what we would call dysplastic kidneys because there's loss of uh, corticomedular differentiation, increased echogenicity. Then when we look at the bladder here, you can see a markedly thickened bladder and all these rugations in the urethelium show that this bladder has been over distended. <clears throat> um, when we look at the uh, biochemical assessment of this baby, keep in mind that for the first three days of a baby's life, the creatinine is going to reflect maternal creatinine. But this child's creatinine is 1.7, higher than maternal creatinine, so it shows again that this baby does have some significant renal impairment. Case number two. This is a seven-year-old child who presents to the emergency room with abdominal pain. And sure enough, they got the fifth vital sign, which is an abdominal CT scan. And you can see here a markedly descended bladder with layering of contrast. So this shows you that his bladder was already filled with urinary stasis as the contrast is coming in from the kidneys. And you can see the prompt nephrograms here, uh, both intrarenal and extrarenal dilation of the collecting system. And when you look at the ultrasound that we obtain on this child, you can see that a CT scan does tend to overrepresent the degree of hydronephrosis. So it's sometimes important to keep that in mind as you're looking at a CT scan on a child. But here you see that there is some dilation. There's you know, dilation of the uh, pelvis, not so much calocele dilation. The echotexture of the kidney on the right here compared to the liver, pretty normal, no cystic changes. So we have you know, maybe SFU grade two dilation of the kidneys on both sides. But look at this bladder here, markedly distended, thickened bladder wall, and significant post void residual. Case number three. This is a 14-year-old who was referred to us for persistent nocturnal enuresis. Um, anytime a child has a significant persistence of enuresis, we will get an ultrasound to assess. And uh, sure enough, this child has a uh, significant dysplasia of his kidneys. He's got significant pelvic caliectasis, some cystic changes in the kidney here. Uh, and this is his post void residual. So his bladder doesn't fit on a single frame. That's always concerning. And when it's a full bladder, this is his post void bladder. So even more concerning. And the last one is a two week old male who had failure to thrive and persistent projectile vomiting. So the pediatrician being very astute was thinking this may be pyloric stenosis, got an abdominal ultrasound, showed that the pylorus was normal, but the ultrasonographer happened to take a look at the kidney on the left side and said, whoops, we better get an ultrasound of this kidney and urinary tract. And so we got a dedicated ultrasound and showed significant hydronephrosis of both kidneys. Um, here's the hydronephrosis on the left kidney. This kidney was very dysplastic and so popped a leak and there's a perinephric urinoma here, a thickened bladder wall and um, you know some urine within that bladder. So what do all these cases have in common? Okay. And also just keep in mind that uh, Mickey Mouse ears on a renal ultrasound, never a good sign, always beware of that. So what do they have in common? Well, when we got the VCGs, we get that answer. So this is the first case, this is the newborn with uh, elevated creatinine and uh, cystic changes in the parenchyma. And you can see here the post valve, dilated proximal urethra, high-grade reflux. 
Case number two was the child with the abdominal pain with the CT scan. And you can see a markedly enlarged bladder, post fetal valves, no reflux though. Case number three was the um, child with the persistent enuresis. And again, a clear depiction of the valves here. Case number four is a two, two week old with suspected pyloric stenosis and showing high grade reflux, a markedly dilated proximal urethra with valves. So all these cases, push urethral valves and the push urethral valves is the great masquerader. They can present in many, many different ways and you have to have a high de degree of suspicion. So today I'm gonna to spend the next hour with you just talking about the pre and postnatal management of push urethral valves. As, as uh, Dr. Grant mentioned, uh, my name is Pramod Reddy. I'm a pediatric urologist and work at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. The learning objectives for today, for the next uh, few um, minutes is gonna be, what are post lethal valves? How do we diagnose them? How do we prognosticate the clinical significance, the prenatal management, postnatal management, and the take home message? Important note that uh, I'm gonna be sharing with you some lessons that I've learned from some incredible pioneers in urology, teachers and mentors in urology, some of whom I've had the privilege of working with, and of also my own colleagues here uh, at Cincinnati. So the etiology of post valves, uh, valves are theorized to be caused by persistent urogenital membrane. And some uh, advocate that the, the name valves should be uh, abolished. Uh, this is a name that goes back to the time of Hugh Hampton Young where because they could advance a catheter into the bladder but urine couldn't come out, they thought that there was a valve mechanism. Uh, but really it's a persistence of a congenital urinary, uh, urethral membrane. Uh, and um, this membrane arises at the separation of the urogenital sinus origin of the urethra, which is a prostatic urethra, and the bulbar urethra, which is derived from the urethral plate. And this membrane is present in all male fetuses, and it should normally involute between the seventh and the 11th week of gestation. Depending on the degree of failure of involution and the thickness of the valve, that determines the pathophysiology that we're gonna see in that child. Because of the location of these valves or membrane, um, the, this diagnosis can only occur in the male urethra. So it is a male predominant diagnosis, but has nothing to do with the XY genotype. Uh, and up to 10% of these patients can be associated with a trisomy either 13, 18, or 21. So it is important that during the assessment that you do get a karyotype on all of these individuals. When you look at the various uh, prenatal diagnoses that we encounter, congenital abnormalities of the kidney and urinary tract account for between 50 to 20% of all prenatally detected congenital anomalies. So that's a pretty significant number of that. 80% is hydronephrosis. So this is one of the things that we see very frequently as pediatric urologists. What's the significance and the impact of post valves? Well, the incidence has been between, reported between one in 3,000 and one in 8,000 live male births. The in true incidence is probably higher because that doesn't take into account the, uh, the uh, in utero demise and also the perinatal demise of the uh, newborn infants. Um, this has been relatively stable for the past 30 years, which is important because uh, over the past 30 years, we have seen a uh, increase in the uh, number of uh, hypospadias and undescended testes, which suggests some sort of environmental impact on the diagnosis, but valves have been pretty stable, suggesting that there's no impact on this diagnosis of any sort of environmental uh, toxins. Um, the genetic determinants supposed to be the valves are unknown. Uh, there are uh, anecdotal cases of si multiple siblings, uh, twins where they have had valves or twins where they've not had valves together and also father and son duos where uh, they've had valves. So there certainly is a multifactorial genetic contribution, but we've uh, not figured that out yet. The healthcare burden is pretty significant. If you think about this, uh, between 24 to 45% of children with a diagnosis of post valves are at risk for chronic renal injury. And when you look at the Napertix um, transplant report from 2014, which is the last one they did, 16% of all pediatric transplants have a diagnosis of post lethal valves. More significantly, when you look at this, uh, you know, the number of transplants that occur in a child less than one year of age, they represent almost 70% of the transplants in children less than one year of age, and between up to 66% of all transplants done in boys between two and five years of age. So again, a pretty significant burden to our healthcare system and to the families and children affected by this. Now, the impact of chronic kidney disease when a child does develop um, renal insufficiency uh, goes beyond just their renal health. I mean, you look at this uh, growth curve here and you see that this child never makes it on above the fifth percentile. And so it's pretty significant that their um, impact on their growth is uh, really affected. 
and um, Ryan Thorvan looked at um, the different stages, uh, you know, the five stages of chronic kidney disease and the impact on growth in terms of height, weight, and BMI, and showed that the most significant impact was actually on their height. Um, most of them, even with a CKD stage one, will be normal, but beyond that, they start to drop off uh, below the uh, expected norms. Their weight does the same, but not to the same extent that the height does. And uh, when you look at the BMI, I'm not sure if you can see that or not. Uh, um, I, I, I don't see that uh, part. Uh, the, the gallery is uh, kind of uh, obscuring that. But uh, the BMI is also affected. But uh, these children tend to gain weight. Uh, they gain unhealthy weight. Um, and so their BMIs can be a little bit uh, disproportionately impacted. One of the most significant things, uh, especially when we're looking at when do we begin renal replacement therapy is following the head circumference of the child because that depicts the uh, brain development. And during the first two years of life, there's very significant brain growth that has to occur. And it's important to note that if that doesn't occur, there is no catch up period for that. So we follow the head circumference of these babies really clearly. And when you look at this child here, again, the brain, the head circumference is less than the fifth uh, percentile and never gets above the uh, norm. So the impact on their growth and development is significant when they have chronic kidney disease. So let's look at the prenatal management of valves here. Um, fetal medicine came to be through advances in medical imaging, advances in our understanding of maternal fetal physiology. We had to have a whole branch of ethics because now we had two patients that we dealt with and one of them was the innocent bystander. That's the mother who was putting herself at risk for the benefit of her child. And significant advances in pharmacology and our understanding of me what medicines were safe to give to the mother that would not hurt the child or which we could give the mother to impact the health of the child. Uh, and it's important to uh, recognize that uh, Dr. Harrison, who is considered by many to be the father of fetal surgery, is from University of South, uh, uh, California, San Francisco. So it's very fitting that this uh, lecture is being done as part of this series here. So fetal urinary tract obstruction, also called bladder outlet obstruction, uh, is significant and it has far reaching implications throughout the entire urinary tract, both through a issue of deformation and also malformation. So uh, you can have a uh, reflux occurring because of deformation of the ureterovescular junction causing high pressure uh, bladder storage and uh, reflux of urine. There's renal dysplasia due to malformation of the uh, uh, metanephric blastema developing. When you have a lack of amniotic fluid around the fetus, there's a lack of the pulmonary secretions being retained in the developing bronchial tree and they develop less uh, alveoli. Perinatal death is usually due to either a cord accident due to anhydramnios or can be due to pulmonary hypoplasia shortly after birth. Now the treatment of uh, any sort of fetal urinary tract obstruction is aimed at preventing ongoing renal injury. Unfortunately, we've been trying this for the past 35 years and we have not been succeeding in changing the renal outcome for most of these babies. We have been successful, however, in preventing pulmonary hyperplasia. So that's what we have been successful at, is uh, getting these babies to have functional lungs. But the renal injury, we have not been able to affect that outcome. When you look at the pathophysiology of fetal urinary tract obstruction, uh, the oligohydramnios or anhydramnios causes the uterus to really constrict and contract around the baby and causes skeletal and uh, growth abnormalities. The lack of um, the uh, positive pressure around the uh, growing uh, pulmonary tree causes all those secretions to come out and you have pulmonary hypoplasia. The back pressure and retention of urine causes uh, high pressure on the uh, developing upper tracts, which assist formation in the parenchyma, resulting in increased apoptosis of the tubular cells with tubular damage and a lack of concentrating ability, which results in polyuria. There's also a uh, interference in the signal transduction of nephrogenesis. So we know that patients with post lethal valves or any form of uh, significant urinary tract obstruction will have a fewer number of functional nephrons. So again, as you can see, every single aspect of this fetus is gonna be affected by a thin membrane affecting the common outflow channel of their urinary tract. Let's just take a second to look at the uh, impact on the lung development. So the uh, fetal lung development goes through five different stages. Um, probably the most important one right here is between 17 and 26 weeks, the canicular phase. And that's the time, that's the window that we have for fetal interventions. Uh, beyond that, we're not going to get uh, any more of the branches developed. So if you think about the developing lung as a bunch of grapes, the more stems you have, the more grapes you're gonna develop, the more um, you have normal canicular development, the more alveoli you're gonna develop. And so this is a reason why 
patients with anhydramnios develop uh, pulmonary hypoplasia. And this development is happening, as I mentioned, between the 17 to 26 weeks uh, during the uh, critical phase of glomerular formation too. So that's a pretty no uh, important window for us to keep in mind that any sort of fetal intervention beyond the 26th week is probably not going to have a significant positive impact on that fetus. So one of the things that had to happen for us to be able to consider fetal uh, development uh, and uh, fetal interventions was advances in medical imaging. So the first patent for sonar was issued in 1912. It literally was one month after the Titanic sank. Um, as with a lot of inventions, there was a uh, military use first. And then in 1940s, there was a medical use of ultrasound. And the first use of uh, obstetric ultrasound was in 1950s in Scotland. Uh, we finally had a womb with a view. Sorry, couldn't resist using that pun. Uh, but nowadays we have fetal MRI where we have enhanced fetal imaging. So looking at prenatal ultrasounds, the role of the prenatal ultrasound uh, in assessing a child who has a urinary tract involvement is one, to monitor the extent of involvement of the urinary tract, monitor the amniotic fluid index, monitor for any associated coexisting lesions, and identify fetuses with the lesions that are severe enough that you might consider intervention, but not so severe that intervention would actually be contraindicated. And here you can see the um, uh, pathognomonic sign, the keyhole sign, for those of you who remember who, what, what a keyhole is, uh, this is the bladder with a dilated proximal urethra, so-called keyhole sign. We used to think that that was diagnostic of a postrethal valve, but uh, Bernardi's in 2009 showed that um, the keyhole sign only had a 94% sensitivity and a 43% specificity, so not as pathognomonic as we once thought it was. So what are the things that you should be looking for on a um, urinary tract ultrasound? Uh, prenatally, well, uh, you know, you should be able to visualize the bladder between the 12 to 14 weeks and the bladder should be cycling, right? You should see the bladder fill and empty, fill and empty. Uh, certainly on a level two obstetric ultrasound, you should see the bladder fill and empty at least once. So lack of emptying of the bladder should raise a suspicion of a bladder outlet obstruction. Lack of filling of the bladder should raise the suspicion of a bladder extrophy because you should always be able to visualize the bladder. So if you never visualize the bladder, uh, consider that uh, you're dealing with a situation of bladder extrophy. If the bladder doesn't empty at all, or you see a markedly distended bladder, consider that you're dealing with a bladder outlet obstruction. The kidneys do develop and are visualized by about the 14 to 16 weeks. And um, during the prenatal period, um, our maternal fetal medicine doctors will use the echogenicity of the bones to compare the parenchymal echogenicity. And if the echogenicity is as bright as the bones, they consider those kidneys to be dysplastic. Uh, postnatally, we use the parenchyma of the liver and spleen as our controls. Now, de depending on the stage of development, uh, the dilation of the renal pelvis has a different physiological significance. So less than 32 weeks, the uh, dilation of the uh, pelvis, if it's more than four millimeters, is considered hydronephrotic. And this most of the times is just physiological. It's due to the inefficient emptying and peristalsis of the ureter causing a delayed outflow of urine from the pelvis, not always considered obstructive. Beyond 32 weeks, if the dilation is more than seven millimeters, we considered obstructive. Uh, Dr. Barry Cogan from Albany did an elegant study where he showed that um, actually if the dilation is more than 10 millimeters at any time during the pregnancy, that's clinically significant and that should warrant postnatal evaluation. Very important to keep in mind that the ureter and the proximal urethra are almost never seen on their normal circumstances on an ultrasound. So anytime you see the ureters or the proximal urethra, it's always pathological. <clears throat> Let's take a few seconds here to understand the fetal urinary tract physiology here. And, um, you know, about 80% um, of the nephrons are developed by the middle of the second trimester. So that's pretty important that most of the kidney development has occurred. Um, by about that 24-week uh, point. The uh, urine formation begins as early as eight weeks as we go from the pronephros to the mesonephros. The mesonephros does actually make a little bit of urine, uh, and then the metanephros is what actually causes the true urinary formation. Um, at its peak, which is uh, beyond 32 weeks, uh, we will see that the rate of urine production approaches about 50 ml per hour. So you should see the bladder fill and empty at least once or twice every hour. Important to keep in mind that uh, early diagnosis of hydronephrosis or bladder outlet obstruction might be a little bit uh, misleading in terms of its physiological significance because up to about the 16 to 18 weeks, there's what we call transitional fluid around the baby. 
It's a mixture of the transudate from the fetus and the amniotic membranes and some urine. Certainly beyond 18 to 20 weeks, it's almost all urine. And so if there is lack of fluid around the baby beyond 20 weeks, that tells you that the urinary tract is affected. If you have normal amniotic fluid around the 20 weeks and beyond, it's just a quick way of saying, okay, so there is functional urinary tract and the urine is coming out of the bladder. <clears throat> so uh, we've had many different ways of trying to stratify and prognosticate the severity of an, uh, antenatally detected hydronephrosis. So the first one was looking at the AP diameter uh, and our uh, radiologist came up with this and they call it either mild, mild to moderate, moderate, moderate to severe or severe. Uh, looking at, di again, different stages of the pregnancy and the different uh, dimensions of the renal pelvis. It is important to remember that the measurement has to be done at a very specific point in a transverse view. Where you draw a line where the parenchyma bisects the pelvis and you measure the diameter of the pelvis at that point. Measuring a dilated extrarenal pelvis is misleading and wrong. So the problem with this is that, uh, you know, it's very subjective, um, the uh, where they were measuring. And so, um, the Society of Fetal Urology came up with the SFU grading system, which was a little bit more uh, objective. They had uh, five grades, SFU grade zero, normal, SFU grade one. There was slight splitting of the uh, central court uh, complex of the collecting system, less than 10 millimeters. SFU grade two was where there was uh, pelviectasis, greater than 10 millimeters without any caliectasis. SFU grade three was pelvicaliectasis with normal parenchymal thickness. And SFV grade four was any degree of dilation of the pelvis with parenchymal thinning. So pretty simple, but again, there was some latitude in terms of the subjectivity. So a few years back, we had a consensus multidisciplinary uh, conference that was conducted at the uh, AUA headquarters, and they came up with the um, prenatal and postnatal uh, classification called the urinary tract dilation system. And here we have a prenatal or the antenatal presentation uh, a normal, A1 and A2, 3. And also now the strength of this was that we could now also look at the postnatal dilation and use this. Keep in mind, even though we the, use the uh, SFU system postnatally, it was clearly meant to be used as a prenatal tool. So uh, we had been using it for both prenatal and postnatal, but until the UTD classification system came along, we didn't have a specific postnatal classification system for uh, grading hydronephrosis, and now we do. So which grading system is best? Uh, well, you want the grading system to be able to answer two questions. You know, can that grading system uh, of the imaging of the prenatal kidneys predict long-term kidney function and identify those patients who are at risk and might benefit from intervention? And uh, when we look at that, uh, actually all three of them have a pretty comparable accuracy for the higher grade. So if you're thinking about uh, which system is gonna work best uh, for the more severely affected fetus, all three of them actually work pretty well. But what I would tell you to do is uh, go down to your radiology department, sit down with the radiologists who do most of your ultrasound and say, can we agree upon which system we're going to use and use that grading system in our report so that everyone knows what the uh, system is being used and how we're grading uh, the uh, hydronephrosis in your particular setting. Now, the goals of management of prenatal hydronephrosis are very important. We have to differentiate transient or physiological dilation of the developing urinary tract which usually is going to resolve with, without treatment. It's just as the ureter uh, matures and we have better, more efficient peristalsis, we're going to get urinary movement out of the pelvis down to the bladder. From pathological dilation, which is where a fetal urinary tract that is significantly obstructed that requires either prenatal and or postnatal interventions. So that's our challenge, is differentiating transient where no intervention is required other than counseling. And don't underestimate the power of counseling the expectant couple from pathological dilation. So we now have a prenatal MRI that we can use to help us interrogate the uh, fetal anatomy and physiology a little bit better. Um, the MRI is now uh, possible without any sedation. Uh, we can get an MRI done very, very rapidly. Um, and so it negates any fetal movement. And the benefit is that we get a view of the entire fetus. Multiple organ systems can be assessed. So here you can see that uh, at our hospital, they actually develop uh, an algorithm where we can measure the lung volumes and they color code the lungs and then look at the uh, surface area of the color coded um, pixels. <clears throat> and we can do this throughout the pregnancy to make sure that the lung volumes are improving. Here are three different presentations of uh, bladder outlet obstruction. So here you can see massively dilated bladder, dilated proximal urethra with an obstruction. 
Here you can see a fetus that does have obvious obstruction, but there's normal amniotic fluid around the fetus. And here there's a fetus with anhydramnius and a markedly thickened bladder with uh, an obstruction. So, you know, push lethal valves in utero can present many different ways depending upon the degree of obstruction. And looking at comparing the imaging quality that we get from a MRI with an ultrasound. So here we have an ultrasound that shows a thickened bladder, the keyhole sign. Um, a fairly okay looking right kidney, but the left kidney here has a perinephric urinoma. And here on the MRI, you can see that, uh, you know, there is an, you know, a little small pocket of amniotic fluid here. Um, this would be oligohydramnius. You see a distended bladder in the T2 weighted images. This dark line around the bladder is the uh, thickness of the bladder wall. Comes to an abru uh, abrupt obstruction here. There is a tortuous ureter on the right with hydronephrosis. The left kidney is pretty dysplastic and is immediately dislocated or displaced rather uh, due to a perinephric urinoma. So uh, again, much more imaging in, in information. We also see that there is normal lung volumes here in this fetus and a normal brain. So in our, in our fetal care center, if we have multiple organ systems affected, we're not gonna recommend any sort of interventions. And again, uh, the MRI can show you nicely this dark outline around the bladder. That's the thickness of the bladder wall. And here is that push through valve or obstruction. Now keep in mind that uh, not all um, uh, images that show a distended bladder are gonna be a bladder that's obstructed from push through valves. You have to know the gender because this is a female fetus with a significantly distended bladder, hydrocolpus and a blown out kidney. Um, this is a patient who has a cloacal malformation. So it is important to get the carry type so you know what the diagnosis that you're addressing is. Okay, so uh, you know, what's the management of prenatally detected fetal urinary tract obstruction? <clears throat> the first is to try and identify those fetuses that are gonna benefit from interventions. And uh, that would mean that their injury to the kidneys is reversible. Uh, Dr. Glick in 1985 came up with the um, uh, system of uh, looking at uh, fetal bladder taps and looking at the urine. Now the urine in a normal healthy fetus should be pretty hypotonic uh, and showing that this urine, because it's not leaving the body, is more what we'd call stale urine, uh, tends to be more hypertonic. Unfortunately, over the past 35 years, we've shown that this is not that great of a system. And uh, those numbers actually don't show us any long-term predictability. Uh, of all those um, metrics that we use there, the only one that's actually been shown to be time-tested and true is the beta-2 microglobulin. If the beta-2 microglobulin is above eight, that does have a positive predictive value of showing a poor outcome from a renal standpoint. And the simple reaccumulation of fluid in the bladder doesn't sh uh, rule out any significant post-renal insufficiency. It just tells you that the kidneys are still cap capable of making urine, but doesn't tell you that they're gonna be normal kidneys. Does the amniotic fluid index actually have any sort of a, a role in uh, showing that the kidneys are uh, going to have any sort of significant impact? And the answer is yes. So Zakaria out of Italy in 2005 showed that the amniotic fluid is actually a very low tech, uh, significant indicator of showing and predicting what the uh, health of the uh, kidneys is gonna be. <clears throat> so if you have normal amniotic fluid index, 100% uh, fetal survival with normal renal function. If you have oligohydramnios where the amniotic fluid index is in the 25th percentile, or less, um, there may be up to a 42% mortality in fetuses that have urinary tract obstruction, and 70% of them will go on to having chronic renal failure. If you have anhydramnios, where the amniotic fluid index is less than the fifth percentile, 80% mortality, uh, again, due to either pulmonary mortality or from cord accidents with a fetus in the third trimester, uh, and 100% of those fetuses are gonna have chronic renal failure. So the amniotic fluid does have a uh, prognostic value. Okay, so we've uh, shown that we have a fetus that would benefit from intervention, has recoverable renal injury or reversible renal injury. What are our options? So Dr. Harrison back in the 80s came up with a uh, percutaneous shunt, a vesicoamniotic shunt. You know, the pathophysiology is the bladder is obstructed. There's no fluid coming out around the baby. Let's find a way to drain that fluid from the bladder and repopulate the amniotic space. Simple enough. We thought, hey, this is going to solve that problem came up with an elegant design for the Harrison shunt. The other shunt is called a rocket shunt. Unfortunately though, shunts migrate, they don't work as well, the babies pull them out. So sometimes you have to put multiple shunts in. And even though the shunts did show repopulation of the amniotic plate, uh, fluid, we had pulmonary survivors, but unfortunately we were not impacting the renal outcomes. 
in the era of minimally invasive surgery, we now have the ability to do a fetus, fetoscopic intervention. So we can do fetoscopy and a fetal cystotomy and fetal cystoscopy. And here is a view from one of the few times we were successful with a flexible ureter scope, able to visualize the post lethal valves and then use a homium laser to actually ablate the valves. But I'll tell you that uh, unfortunately, we're not able to do that as often as one would hope. The curvature, the degree of angulation of the posterior urethra is so acute that we're not able to negotiate the curve and visualize the valve leaflets. So oftentimes what we do is we put a guide wire through the urethra and then put a double J stent across there. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Harrison in the 1980s did um, offer the option of uh, open fetal surgery and uh, undertook about eight cases. Unfortunately, had a 50% mortality rate. Um, when we began our fetal care center here, we had an IOB approved protocol to try and do open fetal surgery. We had uh, four patients that we uh, were able to put into the protocol and these are images from one of our cases. Uh, here you see the uh, hysterotomy being done, the baby is being delivered partially. We only do deliver the lower part of the baby. If you completely deliver the baby, then you won't be able to put the baby back in the uterus. So one of the team members job is to stabilize the fetus and make sure the entire fetus doesn't come out. And then you work as fast as you can to create a big uh, vesicostomy here using big sutures because the tissue, the quality of the tissues is very, very friable. You put the baby back in and we're able to immediately see the decompression of the dilated urinary tract. Uh, unfortunately, we also had a 50% mortality rate. And so we have kind of um, paused with our open uh, fetal intervention um, arm of the um, interventions that we offer. So why is it that uh, the shunts that had such great promise don't work? <clears throat> well, going back to high school physics, you know, these are long, narrow tubes and resistance is directly proportional to the length of the shunt and inversely proportional to the radius of the shunt. So the amount of force that it takes to get urine to go from the bladder to the um, amniotic space is not insignificant. And we do know that pressures above 40 centimeters of uh, water or 29 millimeters of mercury injures the kidney in adults. We don't know what that value is in fetuses, but when we were doing fetal interventions, we were measuring the opening pressure of the bladder and they were very, very high in these fetuses. Also, we know from Dr. Mitchell's uh, work on um, normal bladder development that uh, the lack of uh, bladder cycling is uh, significant in that it prevents the bladder from growing properly. So um, having a bladder that's constantly decompressed, probably not very helpful. <clears throat> and then also looking more specifically at the physiology here, uh, going back to our nephrology uh, days in medical school, you can look at Bowman's capsule here and look at the various hydrostatic pressures, narcotic pressures uh, that derive the filtration pressure that we need. And so the hydrostatic pressure in the glomerular tuft um, results in a 10 millimeter pressure. That is the filtration pressure and that allows for urine to be made. When you increase the pressure in the bladder, now you have hydrostatic pressure in Bowman's capsule much higher, and this results in a negative filtration pressure, essentially obstructing that particular nephron that causes activation of the renin-angiotensin system and fibrosis of the nephron. And if that happens often enough, you will have uh, uh, renal scarring. So that's the underlying pathophysiology of why pressures above 40 centimeters of water in the bladder cause damage to the upper tracts. So as I mentioned, you know, we undertook four procedures with open fetal vesicostomies. We only had two that survived a delivery, um, very similar to what Harrison had 30 years ago. So despite all the advances, we were still not able to overcome some of the limitations. And the other thing is that uh, when we do a fetal, uh, open fetal intervention, we can only allow that pregnancy to be carried for another 10 weeks. And so we were delivering these fetuses at a very, very uh, preterm pre stage. But this is one of my patients that we did the open vesicostomy on. He's now 12 years old. He lost his left kidney because it was very dysplastic. He had the vesicoureteral renal dysplasia syndrome. So we took out his left kidney, but his solitary right kidney is functioning normally. He's got normal renal function and uh, is a healthy child who just loves life. So when you look at the ethics of prenatal interventions, uh, you know, as Steve Jobs said, deciding what not to do is as important as deciding what to do. So knowing when to intervene and when not to intervene is very important. <clears throat> and uh, it's important to keep in mind that we're dealing with a patient, that's the fetus, and a innocent bystander, that's the mother who's gonna put her life at risk for the health of her fetus. And we have to be very careful not to take advantage of that family. And also I'd ask all of you, anytime you're doing a prenatal intervention to please tell the mother that it's not her fault, that there's nothing that she did that caused this to happen to the child. And there's nothing that she could have done to prevent it because the mothers carry a huge sense of guilt 
and hearing that from you won't obviate the guilt, but it will at least reduce some of that guilt that they feel. So it's important to keep in mind that some fetuses may be too healthy where they have, yes, they have some degree of obstruction, but there's normal amniotic fluid uh, and no intervention is required for those fetuses because you're going to put the mother at risk for no obvious benefit to the fetus. The other extreme is that the fetus might be too sick where intervention is not going to cause any benefit to the fetus and again, harm to the mother. And these are where we have significant displacement of the kidney, cystic changes in the kidney, uh, abnormal urinary parameters, the beta-2 microglobulin might be over eight or an abnormal carrier type. And again, no intervention is recommended. So uh, Dr. Ruano, when he was at the, May at the uh, at, uh, Baylor and then now at Mayo Clinic came up with a staging system to say, how do we stratify lower urinary tract obstruction by disease severity? And he came up with three stages. Uh, stage one, where there's very mild involvement, no intervention is required other than counseling. Stage three, again, no intervention for the benefit of the urinary tract, but you might intervene if you wanna try and get what we call a pulmonary survivor. And stage two is where we really need to focus our interventions on. Uh, sometimes they will ask you, is there any benefit for early delivery of the fetus uh, for urinary tract issues? And the answer is no. The uh, decision for early delivery should always be made based on maternal health factors or obstetric factors, but not urological indications. And it's because uh, there are significant issues related to prematurity, both immediately after birth and also lifelong. So uh, preterm delivery is not without a significant cost to the fetus or the infant. <clears throat> okay, so we've talked about the prenatal management. Um, now that you have a patient suspected of having post valves, what's next once they're delivered? Well, the newborn management of the fetus or the infant with valves is first of all, stabilize the patient. Uh, most patients with significant valves will have some degree of pulmonary involvement, so the neonatologists need to assess that, assess their APGARs, and intervene to stabilize the patient. From a urological standpoint, all we need to do is to go ahead and decompress the bladder, and we recommend using a feeding tube or a non-balloon catheter. If you put a balloon into that bladder that's so hypertrophied, it's going to contract around that balloon and it cause a UVG obstruction. Then you want to, at some point, uh, get an ultrasound to uh, assess the anatomy of the bladder and the genitalia and also kidneys and detect any other associated anomalies that the fetus may have. Remember, 10% of these fetuses will have trisomies. And then you have to design a personalized care plan for that patient and counsel the family and prepare them for the journey ahead. Understand that uh, you know, we have to take care of the family as we're taking care of the child and provide them with psychosocial uh, support because they're gonna be you know, potentially rather stressed out about the health of their child and what's going on with their baby. Uh, as all these tests are being done. So we recommend starting off with an ultrasound and that can be done at the bedside early on. Uh, if you've put the catheter in, then getting the ultrasound will also let you know if the catheter is in the right place. Again, beware of the Mickey Mouse sign. Anytime you see that, that tells you that there's significant dilation of the uh, kidneys and any debris within the collecting system is a sign that there's stasis either from reflux or obstruction. And postnatally, you wanna look at the echo texture compared to on the, on the left side here, uh, looking at the uh, spleen on the right side, the liver. If the echogenicity is greater than the echo texture of the parenchyma of the liver or spleen, that indicates dysplasia and medical renal disease. <clears throat> when you look at a VCG, it's important to make sure that you communicate with the radiologist performing the cystogram that they should take out the catheter. If you leave a catheter in, it might uh, force the valves to remain open and you'll miss the diagnosis. And it's not just the diagnosis, uh, the demonstration of the valves here. There are five things that I'd like you to keep in mind when you're looking at a VCG. One is, yes, the valves. Number two is to see if there's a change in the caliber of the urethra. Here you can see dilated post-urethra and a normal caliber um, distal urethra. So that change in caliber is uh, very important. Looking at the bladder neck area here and the thickness of this um, negative filling defect here, this is the thickness of the bladder muscle. And so the wider this is, the more hypertrophy the bladder muscle is. Evidence of high pressure voiding either with the diverticulum, trabeculations, or reflux, and also evidence of high pressure voiding with an obstruction, such as reflux of contrast into the ejaculatory ducts. So those are five things that you need to look for that are going to support the diagnosis of push lethal valves. And if you see four of those and you don't see the valve here, ask them to repeat the VCUG because sometimes they may have missed the valve membrane. And the goals of managing a child with diagnosis of valves is one, protect the upper tracts. We have to protect the kidneys and the ureter. Do not forget the health of the ureter. We often forget that there's a very important organ between the kidneys and the bladder and the ureter. Uh, and we have to make sure that we always keep in mind the health of the ureter also. 
We want to protect the bladder to provide an adequate volume, low pressure continent reservoir for urine that allows for appropriate emptying. We want to minimize the risk of urinary tract infections from high pressure storage of urine in that native bladder. At age appropriate time, allow for social continence, protect the renal function as the child grows. And that's the difference between adult patients and pediatric patients is that there is going to be stripping of renal reserve as the child goes through growth uh, spurts. And so we always have to maintain the um, health of those kidneys to make sure the child grows properly. And eventually we want to make sure that whatever interventions we do to allow this child to protect their kidneys, allow them to get social continence, we should enable them to be independent in their care and have an appropriate psychosocial body image. So that brings us to the concept of Kura personalis. We have to take care of the whole individual. And, um, you know, I learned this concept when my daughter went to uh, Xavier University, which is a Jesuit school, and Kura personalis is an Ignatian Jesuit principle of care of the whole person. Uh, and that's just a beautiful sentence that tells us that as physicians, that's our job is to take care of the whole person, not just a urinary tract. And unfortunately, the silos of modern medicine do cause harm to our patients as we become more and more specialized. We have to learn to work together for the singular benefit of our patient and their families. <clears throat> so when you look at the goals of management of a patient with valves, this is, as I mentioned earlier, a journey. At birth, we have very different goals. We want to incise the valves, get rid of the obstruction, initiate medical therapy as indicated to protect the kidneys, allow for bladder drainage, whether it's with surgery or with uh, intermittent catheterization to protect the upper tracts, maintain their growth and nutrition. So getting a renal dietitian involved, their pulmonary health has to be looked at, and then also psychosocial uh, support for the parents. And as the child grows, we want to protect the kidneys, achieve social continence, address uh, normal development. We've shown that uh, a significant number of our patients with valves do have developmental delays and a higher incidence of um, uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Also uh, allow for self-care and independence. And now our shift changes from the parents to the child, ensure that they have appropriate wellness and mental health. And then we have to carry them through that journey of becoming a young adult, where again, we want to protect their kidneys and bladder, minimize the consequences in the sequelae of chronic kidney disease on their heart, um, identify early on any hypertension and treat it so that we minimize any of the uh, complications resulting from hypertension, enable them to be independent in their care, again, wellness and mental health. So there's got to be a focus on the mental health because a lot of these children do have significant uh, burden from living with a chronic condition and does uh, play a role in uh, causing impact on their mental health. We then have to address any concerns that they have about their sexual health and fertility. And there've been numerous studies that show that uh, patients, adults with valves have normal sexual function, but their um, psychosocial morbidity and mental um, illnesses can cause some degree of sexual dysfunction. And for the most part, they do have normal fertility. <clears throat> now our goal is to maximize socialization and entry into the workforce and a positive body image. So you can see that from birth to a uh, young adulthood, we have a very, significant challenge and uh, what we have to offer for these children and patients as they go through their um, uh, growth. And after all, what we want for all of our patients is that we want their kidney health to be protected, whether it's their native kidneys or a transplant kidney, minimize complications, continence from a urinary tract standpoint, mental wellness and independence of care, rewarding sexuality and normalized anatomy. You know, we have to ensure that we enable them to fulfill the potential for a normal life. And we can't do that alone. And so that's why taking lessons learned from the spina bifida clinic, which is a multidisciplinary clinic, we need to have a similar multidisciplinary approach to children with valves, where we have a neonatologist, a pediatric surgeon, pediatric urologist, nephrologist, pulmonologists, psychologists, pediatricians, developmental pediatricians, and a transplant surgeon all working together and being supported by a very important uh, team. Uh, more important than actually the physician team is the coordinator of the program, a nutritionist, a social worker, Dallas, a coordinator and a transplant coordinator. These members of the team are actually more important because they're in constant connection with the family and assessing and taking care of the children on a more uh, real-time basis. So the ongoing management of a child with valves, you know, are their kidneys at risk and is the bladder at risk? And that's kind of the question that we have to ask and that's where our treatment is gonna be focused on. <clears throat> so when you look at the um, concept of a post valve bladder, uh, there were a number of different um, um, seminal papers that allowed our understanding to improve. So Dr. Mitchell talked about the physiology of the bladder and allowing for normal 
emptying and uh, filling the cycling of the bladder and valve bladders don't empty well, so they don't cycle well. Uh, Dr. Glassberg also showed the concept of a pseudo post-void residual, which is that the valve bladder never really empties well because all of the urine that is reflux into those dilated ureters when the bladder stops contracting comes back down. So you have a bladder that never truly empties. Uh, Dr. Peters talked about the different uh, phases that the uh, bladder goes through and came up with a urodynamic classification. Early on in the infants, these bladders are very hypertrophied and high pressure. And as they go through teenage years and puberty, um, these bladders become um, very underactive and flaccid. Uh, Holmdahl from Sweden came up with the understanding of the different phases of bladder function. And then uh, Dr. Glasberg and Holmdahl showed the benefit and can actually show uh, reversal of in injury to the kidneys by the simple introduction of intermittent catheterization to ensure proper low pressure emptying of the bladder. And then Dr. Steve Koff in 2002, huge contribution with the concept of uh, continuous drainage of the bladder overnight to just drop the pressure in that system. So each one of them is a very important uh, concept there. We have to keep in mind that the bladder does morph with age and with different stages of pathophysiology. So early on, we are left with an infant who has a very high pressure bladder hypertrophy detrusor. This is an obstructed system. There's high intravesical pressure. There's detrusor hypertrophy. It's going to cause a UVJ, a functional UVJ obstruction, and you're not going to see any reflux. After you incise those valves and cause that uh, bladder to start changing, you're going to see that the detrusor starts to remodel. There's no longer a UVJ obstruction, and so now you're going to initiate, you're going to see reflux. You're going to unmask that reflux. So seeing reflux as the bladder is improving is actually not a bad thing. It actually tells you that things are actually getting better. Uh, and then we're down this pathway towards normal, where we have normal intravesical pressures, normal detrusor as it continues to remodel, and that can be helped with the use of ditropan um, or Botox. And uh, we get to the point where we want, which is no obstruction at the level of the UVJ and no reflux with normal filling pressures. Keep in mind that this pathway can be completely reversed if we don't maintain that uh, vigilance, and we can go back to having an obstructed hypertrophy bladder. And the concept of uh, storage pressures being unsafe in the urinary tract uh, Dr. McGuire had that landmark paper that showed that in adult patients, pressures above 40 centimeters cause upper tract deterioration. Um, and that's the storage pressure, not emptying pressures. And when we look more into this, um, you know, the um, renal pressures correlate very closely with bladder pressures, even without reflux. So going back to that uh, images that I showed you of the uh, glomerular Bowman's capsule and how that uh, high pressure in Bowman space, the hydrostatic pressure in Bowman space can actually constrict the glomerulus and cause a, a negative filtration pressure and uh, ischemia of the uh, glomerulus and loss of the uh, glomerulus. So high pressure in the bladder is definitely not safe for the individual glomeruli. And if that is persistent, you're gonna have renal scarring. <clears throat> and there can be actual uh, imaging distortion. So on ultrasound, you'll see that there's distortion of the renal papilla and the intrarenal um, reflux within the renal pelvis when pressures exceed 40 centimeters of water. There's ongoing upper tract deterioration shown by Dr. McGuire and also Dr. Bernie Churchill from Toronto. And then Dr. Bauer, uh, Stuart Bauer from Harvard has shown that there's upper tract injury that occurs even with dyssynergic voiding and high voiding pressures. So storage pressures and voiding pressures, if they're abnormal, persistently can cause upper tract damage. And we have to keep in mind that there is, um, you know, renal susceptibility to barotrauma. So when we have an adult kidney with intact lymphatics, we know that the safe pressure is uh, less than 40 centimeters. We don't know what that is in pediatric kidneys with int in intact lymphatics. And the most susceptible are the transplant kidneys where we've disrupted the lymphatics and uh, prevent the pop-off mechanism. So quickly here, looking at um, <clears throat> the pathophysiology of a valve bladder. So Holmdahl has shown that uh, patients with valves have a higher number of voids, lower voided volumes and higher post-void residuals. So here, when we have dysplasia, there's renal injury. That injury causes a concentrating defect. You have polyuria, so you have an over-distended bladder. That bladder doesn't empty well, so you have a high post-void residual. And also there's reflux from high storage pressures. Whenever that bladder stops emptying, the reflux volume comes back in, and that's the pseudo post-void residual. This increased volume, this increased storage volume, causes a significant metabolic demand on the detrusor muscle. And so now you have an increased um, uh, mechanics, me me uh, working mechanism and me metabolism, and that causes ongoing fibrosis of the bladder, again, resulting in higher bladder pressures. This results in uh, hypercontractility and detrusor hypertrophy, instability, 
all of these high pressure causes infections and ongoing renal injury and this cycle just continues. If you start emptying the bladder with catheterization or with alpha blockers to try and alleviate some of the obstruction, you're going to immediately stop that cycle. And uh, Dr. Koff's contribution of uh, overnight drainage for eight hours to 10 hours a day, you're going to let this bladder kind of rest. So you stop this cycle. And that's very important. <clears throat> Uh, this is Dr. Glassberg's experiment where he looked at, uh, you know, what happens in these children with a nuclear study. He drained their bladder and showed that uh, the contrast, the radionuclide tracer, was already refluxed up all the way up into the kidneys before they emptied their bladder, mixing with the urine in the bladder. And then after they voided, they really didn't empty uh, because, uh, you know, you vo voided what was in the bladder, but also shot some urine back up into the uh, refluxing ureters. And then within five minutes of the post-void, the bladder had refilled with tracer because that's the pseudo PVR. And then three hours later, you have the pre-void, you have a significantly larger volume because now this is all the post-void residual plus the new urine coming from those kidneys. And this cycle just continues over and over again. So in order to stop it, you have to have better emptying of the bladder. We can see that the evolution of the bladder function does change with age. And we start off with these high pressure bladders uh, and as the patient gets older, the bladder volume increases because it's volume of urine plus the post void residual. And we'll see these teenagers coming in with like a 1000 ml bladder capacity with significant detrusor decompensation and a bladder that's failing. And that's where they have um, end stage renal disease. So really, if you can intervene and cause these bladders to empty better, you're gonna get them to maintain this normal curve. So if you just remember this diagram here, this is gonna tell you how to take care of these patients. This brown curve here, so this is Starling's curve looking at pressures per volume <clears throat> and the normal bladder, you have very little change in pressure for increasing volume till you get to an expected bladder capacity and then you have an em emptying. And here the uh, myofibrils of the bladder are appropriately cross-linked, so you have better contraction. When you have a hypertrophied bladder of the infancy, you have high pressure storage and um, there the management is uh, anticholinergics. People talk about augmenting, but we've really gone away from augmenting. We haven't augmented a patient with a valve bladder in over 10 years. So really try and medically manage those patients. And Botox has been a, a definite adjunct to the management of these patients. When you fail to manage these bladders, these bladders then start to decompensate and you have a shifting of that Starling's curve to the right where now the muscle fibers don't overlap anymore. There's no ability to contract efficiently. So the emptying volume fraction in that bladder is very low and there's a high PVR and that causes ongoing damage to their kidneys. So there the intervention is intermittent catheterization, empty those bladders. So our overall urological goals for these patients is, you know, control the bladder pressure, whether it's with uh, ablation of the valves, intermittent catheterization and anticholinergics, a vesicostomy, alpha blockers to reduce the uh, bladder outlet pre, uh, resistance or Botox. And Homdahl has shown that intermittent catheterization can stabilize the renal injury delay the onset of end-stage renal disease as long as possible. Uh, we know that the outcomes of transplant in children and teenagers is not as good as in adults, so we want to try and protect their renal function as much as possible, so they have normal growth, appropriate development, and appropriate school performance. Avoid augmentations of these patients. When indicated, transplant them, but the goal is to get these patients to have a functional bladder so they become adults who can void spontaneously. Uh, another important thing is that uh, you know, want to keep in mind anytime you're operating on these children that there's a precious amount of abdominal real estate and you want to keep in mind that these children will often require G-tube. And so if you're going to do a ureterostomy, make sure you place that ureterostomy away from a potential future transplant incision. If you're going to do a vesicostomy, place the vesicostomy a little bit eccentrically <clears throat> rather than in a midline because they may need a PD catheter in the future. So when you're planning today's surgery, think about the future surgeries they may need and plan your procedures accordingly. So improving care and safety for children with valves, you know, are we really making a difference? And unfortunately, most of our evidence comes from level two case reports or level three cohort studies. There have been two uh, real attempts at trying to do clinical, prospective clinical trials. And the best one was from the UK, the Pluto trial. Uh, the goal was to recruit 200 expectant mothers and randomize them either into shunt versus observation to show the benefit of shunting. Unfortunately, a lot of the families, when they were randomized to observation, they would go seek care elsewhere and uh, demand a shunt placement. So really didn't randomize appropriately. And also a large number of these patients went on to termination of pregnancy. So eventually there was only about 31 patients who were randomized um, and uh, the data was um, not really meaningful. So that uh, study unfortunately never was uh, completed. 
Uh, it is important to always document the um, renal function in these patients. So calculate the eGFR. Uh, you can use the C to calculate the GFR and then document the CKD stage because how can you treat what you don't measure, right? We also want to make sure that we talk to these families about the uh, risks of medications and uh, medication safety in patients with chronic kidney disease. And so here at Cincinnati, we've created a, a very simple card that we give to families using the traffic light signal. You know, red medications are dangerous. Talk to your nephrologist or your urologist. Yellow, talk to your pediatrician and proceed with caution. And then green medication, you know, we're always telling these families what they can't do. We have to empower them to say, these are things that you can't do. And so the green zone tells them what medications are safe for them to use. At the end of the day, we want to all help these patients, but we can only do it as a team. We have to remember that there's three objectives. One, protect the upper tracts. Two, allow for social continence. And then three, allow for independent, highly functioning adults to um, be the end result for these children. So uh, thank you very much. Please be safe and stay healthy. And I wish all of you and your families a happy holidays. Happy to take any questions at this point. Thanks, Dr. Okay. Reddy, for that talk. Um, it's definitely a bunch of stuff I learned. Um, I don't see any questions in the queue. I just have one quick question. Um, do you start all these kids initially, all your valve kids initially, on CIC, or are there certain do you, uh, or is there a certain criteria that you use to start them on CIC? It's a great question. So um, I look at the VCUG and uh, looking at one what's the post-void residual? If I see there's a significant post-void residual or high-grade reflux, and I know that that high-grade reflux is gonna cause a pseudo-PVR, I'm gonna put them on intermittent catheterization in the NICU, uh, along with Ditropan. Uh, Dr. John Park, when he was a fellow, had a very elegant study that showed that Ditropan, in addition to the action that we know about, which is uh, a uh, detrusor relaxant, also does actually affect the biodiversity of the uh, bladder muscle development and you have the myofibroblast, which is the stem cell, and the ditropan and encourages more of those uh, myofibroblasts to go into the myoblast pathway rather than the fibroblast pathway. So I put them on ditropan. Almost all my patients get a low-dose ditropan. And then depending on the degree of the post void residual and the degree of reflux, um, I am going to start them on intermittent catheterization with the goal of trying to get maximal emptying of that bladder to allow for the proper cycling. The other benefit is that, you know, teaching a parent how to catheterize their child in the NICU is, is a lot easier than trying to teach a parent of a two-year-old how to catheterize. So you teach them early on, you can always say, hey, look, the child's bladder has gotten better now so we can stop it. But in the future, if we need to reintroduce it, it's a lot easier to introduce. Yeah, makes sense. Um, all right, well, if there's no other questions, I think we can wrap up. We're almost to the nine o'clock hour. So uh, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you. I know that was a lot of information and uh, there is my email address. If you think of any of the questions, please do reach out to me. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, that's a pretty big topic to cover in an hour, but uh, I wanted to make sure we had the full breadth uh, of the uh, discussion, uh, not just the lessons, but also the philosophy of managing these patients with valves. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Eddie, and thank you, Dr. Grant. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye.